Hi, my name is Stuart Bruce. I'm GIS Program Coordinator at Washington College, and today I'm going to lecture about what is GIS and try to explain a little bit about geographic information systems. This lecture is part of our GT 101 course, which is available online at geoworkshops.org. Now, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, There's a pretty common um, definition for GIS. In some academic settings, uh, GIS is also referred to as Geographic Information Science. And many of the professors that uh, are in universities and college prefer to study the science behind the system rather than the system itself. This course is really designed as a professional development workshop and its purpose is to make sure that you are fluent in the actual use of the software. So we're not necessarily going to talk quite as much about the science. Now, over the years that I've been working with GIS, I've heard many different names uh, for what it stands for, such as geologic information uh, system or global information system. Um, so it's important, I think, you know actually what it stands for. Now, GIS is one of three geospatial technologies. The other two are global positioning systems, or GPS. You probably have one of these in the phone that you're using today, or you might have a handheld, say, a Garmin unit, or some type of navigational device in your car. Remote sensing is um, could be, and most people think of it as satellite uh, imagery, uh, but remote sensing is also aerial photography, uh, you could have a ground penetrating radar unit would be considered remote sensing or perhaps in your boat you have a side scanning sonar device so there's different types of remote sensing now within our geospatial technology workshops at washington college we have developed some educational material on global positioning systems uh, under our special topics course you can watch uh, and learn a little bit how to use some of the basic systems we do have advanced um, courses on how to use the trimble uh, GPS devices, uh, the GeoXH and the GeoXT. And we also have a course on remote sensing using NVEX. So as you get better and better at geospatial technology and you're ready to move on past ArcGIS, keep us in mind for some of these more advanced workshops. So what exactly is GIS? There are a lot of different definitions uh, depending on who you consult, but there are some common themes in every definition. I'm going to scroll through some of these. Dr. Paul Bolstad is a professor that writes a very good textbook, which I use in some of my academic classes. And he's basically saying here it's a computer-based system, aids in the collection, maintenance, storage, analysis, output, and distribution of spatial data and information. The definition that the United States Fish and Wildlife Service uses, collection of hardware, software, geographic data, and personnel designed to capture, store, update, manipulate, analyze, and display all forms of geographically referenced information. I like this definition a lot because it includes the personnel, and I think people are the most important part of any GIS system. United States Geologic Survey, um, very similar to Dr. Bolstad's. Uh, it mentions uh, information, data, computer systems, but it doesn't talk about people. And perhaps the definition I like the best is the one by Dr. Roger Tomlinson, who some people consider to be the father of GIS. His definition of a simple definition is not sufficient. I really believe that because GIS is very, very complicated and it has a lot of depth to it. So it's really hard to sum it all up in a simple one-liner. Now, to break apart GIS, I like talking about the geographic component first. And in the geographic component, there are two types of data that any GIS system can use. Uh, and when I say data, I mean spatial data. There are vector data and raster data. Vector data allows for very high precision data modeling, and it's generally considered to be things like points, lines, and polygons. Raster data is a much simpler data model, and the data is organized in cells and rows, um, organized as cells, arranged in rows and columns to form a grid. First, I'm going to talk about vector data. Now, vector data allows you to precisely model 
geographic data, as I discussed, points, lines, and polygons. The key to this is to be able to identify exactly where the location of this feature is on the map. To do this, we use a system called the Cartesian Coordinate System. So we can define a set of X and Y um, parameters, also in some cases known as like longitude and latitude. But this is essential to the understanding of vector data. I'm going to talk about points first. All points have to have a set of X and Y coordinates that define the exact space that the point occupies. This is important so that the computer knows where to draw the dot on your map. In this example here, you can see the Cartesian coordinate system. We have an X and a Y axis, and we've drawn a point uh, within this coordinate system. And this point is clearly defined as the X of 4 and the Y of 3. Another important consideration about vector features is that each feature must have a unique identification number assigned to the feature. This ID is very, very important because it's, it is what allows the software to uniquely identify the feature and to connect information about that feature. Now, without the unique ID and without the information, you would just have a simple mapping system that could draw pretty maps. It's really the information that uh, makes GIS what it is. Now on this slide here, uh, we're out actually mapping manholes. And perhaps we've taken a GPS unit and, and got a set of X and Y coordinates for these points. We assign an ID to it. We assign some information to it. For example, here, we assign a depth and a type. Now, when we go to the next manhole, if we don't assign a unique ID to that, there's no way to sort one manhole from the other manhole. Now, I'm going to talk about lines. Lines are used to display linear features. For example, streams, roads, water lines, uh, transmission lines, uh, things like that. Lines are made up of a series of points that are connected. So each of those points on this line has a set of X and Y coordinates, and the software has instructions to basically connect the dots. Now, in addition to the spatial attributes of the X and Y location for the points, every line has a specified length. And of course, every line has a unique ID. Now, polygons are used to display data that covers a specific area of the Earth's surface. The key here is that it covers an area. Some examples of this would be parcels, municipal boundaries, and police beats. So to review, a line has an area. A line has a perimeter. Now in ArcGIS talk, uh, they don't really say perimeter. They call it shape length. But it's the same thing as perimeter. Every point on the line has an x y coordinate. And every polygon has a unique ID to separate it from another polygon. There are many sources for vector data that you can use for GIS. Uh, there's a lot of federal government sites, uh, a lot of state sites. For example, in Maryland, um, DNR has a download site. SHA, or the State Highway Administration, has a download site. And there's a lot of local uh, governments that produce vector data. Some of them share the data, some of them don't. Um, you really just have to contact them and find out. I've given a link here to one site uh, that you can go looking for data. And we have another uh, section in the workshop that's going to have you uh, basically assist you to find data. Because for the final project for this course, you will have to go find some of your own data and make a map. All right, next I'm going to talk about raster data. Now, I believe that there are really three different types of raster data that you will find are raster imagery. We have aerial imagery, satellite imagery, what I call scanned images. So aerial imagery, and I'm going to expand this so you can take a look at it. This is actually a aerial image of Lewistown, Pennsylvania, where I first started my GIS career. Actually, I'm going to take that back now that I'm looking at this a little carefully. 
This is actually Oil City, uh, Pennsylvania. And if you notice the date in the upper corner there, uh, this is dated actually from uh, July 2nd, 1939. So this is a rather old photograph. Uh, right around the late 20s and the 30s, uh, people started flying aerial photography. Very rich uh, data source. Now, on this particular um, slide, we have a little slider bar here. So I'm going to slide this down here. Actually, you might have to do this on your own to, to read all of this. But basically, aerial imagery is captured uh, from a plane. And uh, depending on the type of camera that's used and the height that the plane flies, it controls what's known as the resolution of the imagery. And I'm going to go over the resolution a little bit uh, in more detail later. Satellite imagery, I'm going to go ahead and expand this image. Now this is uh, Lewistown. Uh, this is actually my former uh, hometown. This area up here is known as the Big Valley. If you're familiar with Penn State University where I used to work, it's located over here. So satellite imagery, as the name would imply, is captured from satellites. There's different kinds of satellite imagery, such as panchromatic or multispectral. Um, and the resolution of the satellite imagery can vary widely. Scanned images. Uh, this map here that we're looking at is a map of Chestertown, where Washington College is located in Maryland. And this is actually a Sanborn fire insurance rate map. So these maps were originally hand-drawn on paper, and then someone took the map, scanned it with a digital scanner, and turned it into a raster imagery. You can do this with almost any type of paper map or a hard copy aerial, photo, uh, aerial photograph. Uh, just the other day, I was at Anne Arundel County, and they have uh, a ton of uh, historical aerial photographs. And I actually used my iPad to take pictures of these, convert them into raster images, and then I georeferenced them inside my uh, ArcGIS software. So I was actually kind of surprised at the, uh, the wonderful resolution I got off my iPad. Now, rasters are also called grids. This data is organized in a format, uh, grid format, by rows and columns. So if you look at this picture here, you can kind of see why people might call it a grid. Now, the important thing within a raster image are the actual cells. So each cell can be assigned a value. Now, depending on what uh, the raster is representing, this value can mean different things. If you're looking at a black and white or panchromatic aerial photograph, the cell value would indicate a grayscale value. If you're looking at uh, high resolution multispectral uh, data, that number represents the reflectance value for the given band. So depending on what the raster data is, will determine what the values is. Now cells are also called pixels. And the example I'm showing here, uh, this is basically raster imagery that's zooming in. So when you're um, basically coming from afar, you can see the picture, but as you zoom in, it gets a little bit fuzzier. And I'm going to go ahead and replay this again so you can see this. So here we're looking at way zoomed in. We can actually see the individual pixels. And as we zoom out, the picture actually takes form and you can understand uh, what it is. And then you can see in red, this is where I sort of started my original uh, slide. So each cell within a raster image has a certain size. These sizes can range uh, quite a lot, um, say from one inch cells to 30 meter cells. The higher the resolution, the more details that you will observe. Now this next slide I'm going to show you is going to give you an idea of this and what the difference would be, say, between a 30 meter cell resolution and a 1 meter cell resolution. So here we have a uh, Landsat image of Mifflin County. This has a 30 by 30 cell resolution. Now this is a satellite image it is multispectral, and you can see from the different colors different types of land cover. 
for example, right here in the center where it looks kind of bright white grayish, this is an urban area. Over here where it looks kind of brownish, this is actually forested areas. And these kind of bright green areas here are agricultural land use. This dark line running through, this is actually the Juniata River representing water. Now this image here is a spot satellite image. This has a 10 by 10 meter resolution. And if you look at it, it has a little bit uh, sharper clarity uh, on the site. You still see the different colors representing different types of land covers. And next we have an image of Lewistown from a DOQQ. This is a digital ortho quarter quadrangle and it has a one meter by one meter resolution. So a little bit sharper, uh, we can really see what's going on in terms of the actual details. This is not a multispectral image though, this is simply an aerial image. Now this is putting um, basically all three of them side by side. We're zoomed in on the main bridge that crosses, crosses the Juniata. So here I can see my one meter, I can see my 10 meter spot, and I can see my Landsat imagery. So if you're trying to use this as a base map to do any kind of uh, perhaps vector digitizing, you wouldn't really want to use the Landsat image for that because it lacks the resolution uh, for you to make out the specific details of the map. Now, raster data sources, uh, pretty much the same kind of places that you would find data for vector data. Uh, however, there are some unique uh, sources, and I've listed uh, one of them here. Um, and if money's no object, you can also purchase uh, satellite imagery um, with the latest uh, Digital Globe Worldview 2 satellite. You can purchase 50 centimeter resolution uh, GIS data, which is really good. Now, some agencies, such as the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, have satellites that could read the writing off a postage stamp from space. However, they don't share this data with us. Uh, if you want to see that, you're going to have to get a job with them and then you won't be able to tell anybody what you do. Next, I'm going to talk about the I in Geographic Information Systems. Now, information is the most important thing in a GIS as far as I'm concerned, um, because that's what gives it the power. Now, in this example here, I'm showing a map of the USA. I have the geographic polygon information to see. Uh, there's some information associated with the polygon based on the labels. But you might ask the question, well, what's the population? Um, did they vote Democrat or Republican in the next election? You could go on and on with the data you could collect about states in America. The key is to be able to link the information that you have to a specific spatial feature. Now, I mentioned the unique idea before. I'm going to say it again. If you have a unique ID for the state, which in the case of a state is more than likely the state name, then you can go out to the internet and you can find Excel spreadsheets and data about states. You could bring that data in, then you could join that to your GIS and make any kind of map you wanted to um, for the states. Now, if we take a simpler project like mapping trees, uh, trees are really easy to map. You can map them with the GPS unit, you could actually look at high resolution aerial photography where you can see the individual tree trunks and you can map them. It's not that hard to make a, a map of a bunch of trees. The hard part is, is getting information about them. So unless you're an expert forester, um, just figuring out what the species of trees can be very difficult. Um, so if you go out and map the trees, you would have to assign a unique ID and you'd have to think about what information you would want to collect. So what information could you collect about trees? Now, the slide here talks about using a Moodle wiki. Uh, we're not going to do that for our professional development course. Um, but if you think about it, you could measure all kinds of stuff about a tree. Now, if you want to, you can pause in the video right now and think about that. Um, or you can just listen to me and I'll tell you some ideas. You might have things like tree species, tree height, tree width. Do squirrels live in the tree? Are the trees buckling the sidewalk? How old is the tree? Um, all kinds of stuff you can measure about a tree. 
when you measure this information, you would collect it and you would type it into what's known as an attribute table. So you can see here we have the tree ID, we have the tree type, and then we would add all these other attributes that we wanted to know about that tree. Now attribute data is organized into rows and columns, kind of like grids, but not really the same thing. Each column is designed for a particular type of attribute data. So you might have a column on height. Every tree would have information on height. There is no limit to the number of columns you can have, although to be honest with you, um, I have run into some problems in ArcGIS when you have, uh, say, 2,000 columns. Uh, ArcGIS uh, kind of chokes a little bit, uh, so you might want to be careful there. Columns in GIS are more commonly called fields, so that's an important thing to remember. Each row has all the attributes for a given spatial feature. So if you have 10 features, you would have 10 rows. There is no limit to the number of features you can have, and therefore there's no limit to the number of rows you can have. But let me tell you, if you add a huge database, like just the other day I was uh, playing with the address point data layer for Maryland, and when you get around uh, two or three million records, uh, when you click a button in ArcGIS, it will take a little bit of time for it to process all that information. Now, there are two main kinds of attribute tables. The first, an internal table. So you can create an internal table within ArcGIS. You can edit it, you can modify it, you can do whatever you want to it in the ArcGIS software. So you do not actually have to use any other type of spreadsheet or database to make data in ArcGIS. Now, you also have the ability to use external tables. Uh, this is data that comes from external source. So let's say that you have a parcel map for the city of Baltimore and you're interested in adding information on owner name. Now, it would not be very productive for you to type all that information into ArcGIS. You would want to go to the um, property office and get all that data from them an external table, and then bring that data into ArcGIS. Now, internal tables are automatically created anytime you create a new spatial feature. The example I'm showing you below, ArcGIS automatically assigns an ID, but it also creates a column that you can use to sign your own unique ID. So therefore, there are potentially two IDs. There's an internal ID, and then there's sort of a user ID. The shape field contains the complex geospatial information about the feature of the polygon. Within the internal table, you can add new fields. Um, once you add the field, then you can edit this data and enter any data that you wish. And again, as I sort of mentioned before, uh, the big benefit here is you don't have to use another software program uh, you can just add the data directly into ArcGIS. This makes a lot of sense uh, unless you're doing massive data entry, in which case it's probably not the most efficient uh, way to enter data. External data gives you the ability to import information. I mentioned the property parcel example already, uh, but any kind of data that you could bring in, as long as you have an ID that you can share, uh, you can import this data into ArcGIS using a process called join. Uh, there's also a process called relate, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, actually, uh, this is covered in a separate uh, course than the one you're taking right now. So some of the external data formats that you can use, uh, you can use, for example, a text file, Excel, uh, DBase, Access, SQL Server, Oracle, uh, any of these kind of uh, spreadsheets or relational databases, those data formats are capable of importing into ArcGIS. Now next I'm going to talk about the system in GIS. Now there are three key components of a geographic information system. We have the software, the hardware, and what I think is the most important element is the people. That would be you. Now, there are many kinds of GIS desktop software. MapInfo, for example, is often used in a business environment. Intergraph uh, has a strong um, presence in the transportation uh, community. Manifold uh, is a pretty decent software. It, it has an advantage of being uh, 
relatively inexpensive. And then ESRI software. We are learning the ESRI software. Uh, they actually control about 70% um, of the market and a very big presence. And the fact that you're taking this course means that you have ESRI software or you're looking at buying ESRI software. Now you will notice on the slide here, I do have links to the manufacturer's web pages for each of these softwares that you can check out on your own if you so desire. Now, the ArcGIS software really has three different levels of software. We have the ArcView level, Arc Editor, and Arc Info. And we're going to talk about each of those. The ArcView level of software, I'm going to go ahead and expand the screen a little bit so you can see it. This is the uh, ArcMap interface. Uh, this is actually a, uh, technically we're learning ArcGIS 10, and this screenshot is uh, ArcGIS 9. But a basic uh, interface, you have your map, uh, layers, different tools, and functionality. The main thing about ArcView is very robust software, uh, but it's really the entry level uh, software. This costs probably about $1,400 or so. Uh, most uh, companies uh, or organizations would have this level of software simply due to the cost. Arc Editor really has the same interface that you saw in ArcView. The difference is that when you purchase the Arc Editor level, you get more tools and more functionality. These are generally displayed in the Arc Toolbox, which we'll be talking about in the next lesson, which is Introduction uh, to Arc Map. It does cost more. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm uh, fully aware what it costs anymore since uh, I work at a college and I have academic site licensing. But in the past, it's cost maybe four or $5,000. So it's probably two to three times the cost of ArcView. Arc Info, again, we have the same interface, but we have even more tools and more functionality that we can use. Um, Arc Info is really something that uh, until you get proficient with the ArcView product, that you're probably not ready to go out and buy Arc Info to start because it can cost as much as $10,000 per license. Now, the benefit to uh, Esri's structuring of functionality for their different products is that no matter which product you use, whether it be ArcView, Arc Editor, or Arc Info, they all have the same interface. So once you learn ArcView, if you progress to Arc Info, everything that you learn at the ArcView desktop level is applicable to the Arc Info level, and you only have to use new tools. Now, in the past, we used to have what was called ArcView 3, and when you progress from ArcView 3 to ArcInfo 7, everything that you learned about ArcView 3 did not apply to ArcInfo 7. Uh, so this was an obstacle to users progressing into more advanced functionality. So I think ESRI was really smart uh, when they redesigned uh, the ArcGIS product line to make the transition to more advanced uh, functionality easier for the user. Now, the first interface we're going to talk about is ArcMap. So ArcMap is the application where you actually create your maps. It's where you view the data, it's where you edit data, uh, and it's the primary interface that you're going to use. I'll just pull this up. Uh, this screen will look familiar to you uh, when you start adding things, although this version is uh, technically uh, ArcGIS 9. The ArcGIS 10 interface looks slightly different. Not that much different, though. Arc Catalog. Uh, our catalogs where you actually organize your data. It's where you would create new data. Uh, you can look in Arc Catalog and search for data, and then you can basically drag this data over to the ArcMap user interface. The Arc Toolbox uh, is really seamlessly integrated into both ArcMap and Arc Catalog. But these are where all the special tools that you will use, for example, clipping or buffering or uh, projecting data, they're all going to be organized very neatly inside the ARC toolbox. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is hardware. So GIS software is very complex. Uh, it uses a lot of intensive graphics. And it's important for you as a GIS professional to understand what the requirements are of your hardware. So if you're not sure what's under the hood of your car, 
or the hood of your computer, really, um, then you're at a disadvantage. So we do have an exercise um, for this particular uh, lesson where we're going to have you investigate what's under the hood of your computer and actually have a separate lecture um, if you're not sure how to figure out what's under the hood that will take you step by step through um, this particular assignment. So this is a good place to have a brief overview of the uh, various components of your system. Now, one of the key things is what operating system you're going to use. Uh, ArcGIS requires Windows XP or better. I'm currently using Windows 7 64-bit workstation, which would be the best, uh, probably the best choice you can use. You need to have a monitor so that you can see the data. I prefer having a large uh, dual monitors. Uh, one monitor is good, two monitors better. Technically, right now at my office, I have three monitors, which is uh, really good. You need to have memory for your computer. At least two gigabytes would be suggested. Uh, most of our GIS workstations at the GIS lab at Washington College have four gigabytes, and some of our machines actually have eight. You need to have a hard drive. GIS data can be very uh, large in size, and uh, unless you're working off a uh, network server, uh, you need to have space to put all of that information. And you want to have a fast hard drive, too. Video card. You need to have a good video card. Um, I think this slide's a little bit uh, out of date. Uh, 128 megs of video RAM is probably the, the absolute bare bones minimum. Uh, most of the video cards that we use have one gigabyte or better of video RAM. And uh, one of our cards, we have a wonderful uh, NVIDIA Quadro 6000 actually has four gigabytes of video RAM. So it is a smoking hot GIS workstation. The processor or the core, this is sort of the, the heart of your computer. Um, I would recommend at least a dual core processor at two gigahertz or higher speed. Some of our fastest computers, uh, we actually have uh, two processors. We're running um, two quad core Xeon processors. We actually have eight processors. Now at some point, um, ESRI will be able to take advantage of multiple processors. Right now the software is what's known as a single threaded application. So it can really only use one processor at a time. But I believe down the road that ESRI is looking at taking advantage of all these multiple processors that are in your computer. Now, finally, um, I think this is an important component of any um, GIS workstation. Uh, you have to have a decent sound system. So when you're digitizing into the wee hours of the morning, uh, you can listen to music and just be a really happier GIS professional. Now, I mentioned the assignment, what's under your hood. Um, there is a place in this uh, Moodle module uh, for you to put some information on your computer specification. Uh, there's also an assignment to have you uh, work on developing some computer specifications. This is kind of really optional uh, for the class. Uh, we're not requiring for the professional development workshop uh, that you do this. Uh, we do require this for some of the uh, training that we do with uh, high schools. Now, people, and again, I'm going to go back to uh, Dr. Tomlinson. No GIS can be a success without the right people involved. So a GIS is uh, very complex, and if you don't have people who understand how to use the software, then um, your system is going to fail. And that's why you're all taking this course, right? You're here to learn more uh, so you can be more productive uh, and an important part of the system. Now, we do have a careers module um, in our special topics pull-down session, uh, which goes into some detail about the many different careers. Uh, however, if, as a professional taking this workshop, you already have a career and you're trying to make yourself uh, better by learning this GIS software. So that's a good move on your part. Now, that ends my uh, lecture on geographic information systems. I hope you enjoyed it uh, and you enjoy the rest of our entire course. Have a great day.